I'm Andrew Haig. My company is Cellsonic. We make 17 different medical machines. And I want to tell you about one of them, which is the shockwave machine. So in this speech, I want to tell you what is a shockwave, what is most important about a shockwave, the history of shockwaves, and the history of cell sonic, how it fits into the evolution of shockwaves. Why shockwaves are the best way of healing and the protocols that you'll need to go through for the treatments. So what is a shockwave? Shock does not mean electrical shock. It refers to the suddenness of a sound. It's an industry that started in Germany, and the word shock is a translation from the German Strassweiler. Now when this is drawn in a graph, what we get is this. With this side being the decibels, the sound level, and here being the time it takes. And you will find this in all the textbooks. From zero decibels, there's a loud bang, which goes up to here, comes down again, goes below zero, and this area is called cavitation, and starts again. I don't really understand how we can go below zero, but it does. So what is important is this bit here. the time it takes to go to the high decimals. That is the most important part. The shorter, the better. And it should take about two nanoseconds. And you don't know how long that is. But let me give you an example. As I'm talking to you, if you turn your head sideways to me, the ear towards me gets the sound six milliseconds before the ear on the other side of your head. So the time it takes for the sound wave, which I'm making with my vocal cords, that's reaching your eardrums, takes six milliseconds to travel that distance about the width of the head. And a nano is a, thou a thousand nanos in one milli. We've got to make a bang in two nanoseconds. And you know how quick sound travels. The reason we have two ears so we can tell where the sound is coming from. We have two eyes so we can see how far away things are. And that is very fast. The fastest thing in the world is electricity, light and electricity. So that's what we use, electricity. Can you, if I draw here, can you see that? So, the way we do it, and, the way, and this is the way it was done when it all started. We have two electrodes. The electricity coming in here, and going out there, making a circuit. Now, as you know, if electricity finds a gap, it will try and jump that gap. So we create a gap of one millimeter, and we push up there, twenty-five thousand volts. It's a high voltage, and it jumps that gap. And as it jumps that gap, it goes bang, and that's all our machine does. It goes bang. It's a natural phenomenon. You hear it in the sky with thunder and lightning, donner and blitzen. And as the electricity goes to earth, as it bursts, as we say, millions of volts, you hear the thunder. Here, as it jumps that gap, you hear a bang. There is no faster way of doing it than that. There are other techniques of making a bang. 
And if you're listening to this over loudspeakers, electricity is moving a magnet, moving a diaphragm, and you're getting a sound wave from the diaphragm, but that's moved more slowly than the electricity jumping back out. One of the problems we have to deal with in our machine is that that process erodes the tips. This tip will wear down, that tip will grow, and when the gap opens up to about one and a half millimeters, we have to stop it. Otherwise, the shorting could happen inside the machine and cause damage. So there is a limit to the life of this. Now, what we do is we build, we build this into a reflector, so that a shock which goes that way, and that way, and that way, also is going down, and then is reflected. Let me start on another page, because it's going to get more beautiful. So we've got a reflector, often called a parabola. The electricity is going to jump the gap. And the shock waves come out in all directions. And they bounce, they bounce off the reflector to a point. The reflector is full of water, and the body, this is placed against the body, so your body is here, and there is gel put between the two, so the shock waves can travel through water, the body is water, 80% of the body is water. In the textbooks, this point here is called F1. And where the convergence is of the shock waves is called F2. And the focal distance of a, of a parabola, of the shock head, the whole of this is the head, is from the membrane to there. So for that distance, and we make a 5, 20, 35, and infinity. And we adjust that by the machining of the shape of the reflector. So we can control the distance into the body that we penetrate to give the maximum concentration of the shock waves. What, what you get is this head Machine from solid brass, reflecting the waves, and you can hold this in your hand. So the whole thing is about that big. The other problems we have to contend with in manufacturing is that the water in there, and water being H2O, is converted into hydrogen and oxygen by the bang. And we have to convert that back into water, because a shock wave cannot pass through a gas. It can only go through water, and that's one of the clever things we have to do. When you're using it, you must make sure that you've got gel here to convey the shock waves into the body, because if there is any gap with air, the shock waves cannot pass. What? I want you to understand, and I'll come across this as we go along now, is that by this we have given you a new non-invasive surgical instrument which is a new branch of medicine originally going back to the cavemen the first form of medicine came from hunting for food people would go collecting food plants 
and find that some of them would cure an injury or an illness. That is now today's big pharmaceutical industry. And everything they make has side effects. Everything. There is some good and some danger in everything you get from the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> the second type of medicine also began with the cavemen when they were hunting for food. And they would cut plants and animals and enemies. And in cutting, they found that there was maybe a way of cutting out some injury or some disease. And that is today's surgery. And laser, the scalpel and the laser, has evolved over the years. So you have the second type of medicine. The third type, which we are now giving you, is non-invasive, has no side effects, is completely drug-free. And sooner or later, we're going to see the first professor of shockwave medicine who can help to explain how all these benefits are occurring inside the body. The history of shockwaves goes back 40 years to Dornier, a Swiss company, who at that time was very big. They had Dornier Medicinische Technique. They made space rockets. They owned Mercedes cars. And they set about removing kidney stones, a big stone deep inside the body, without cutting open the body. And they did it by disintegrating the stone. You drink a lot of orange juice and then you can urinate out the particles. And it was this technique, exactly this, of causing a sudden bang to fracture the stone that they used. And that worked fine till about the mid the mid-90s, and the question was asked, if we're not aiming accurately at the stone and we hit the bone, the ribcage, what happens? And the bone was healing very well. Microfractured and then healed, became a cure for pseudothrotis, the non-union fractures. By about the year 2000, one of the surgeons using this method, Dr. Wolfgang Schaden in Vienna, observed that where he had patients with breakage from skiing and motorcycling, and they'd also cut the skin, the skin was healing better than he expected. So he went and got some non-healing wounds, diabetic ulcers, and he healed them. One lady was 90 years old. She had a diabetic ulcer since she was a teenager. It had never healed in all that time. And at the age of 90, Wolfgang was able to heal it. And he announced this at the ISMSD, the International Society for Medical Shockwave Therapy. Everybody tried it, and everybody got the same good results as he did. So that was the discovery of wound healing using shockwaves. All that you needed was weaker shockwaves and a much smaller and handheld machine, which is what he specialized in making. Now, the use of shockwaves hasn't stopped there. What it was realized is because this power is sending stem cells to the wound site. Why and how is the interesting part. It seems to have, well it does have, an effect on the nerves. And it's in that area that in the future we're going to see a lot of developments. I spoke to a Dr. Ken Craig in New Zealand. I rang him one morning and he said, good evening, and he said, I'm busy, and we spoke for an hour. His main interest is pain control. And he's interested in lower back pain. So I said, well, where are you going to drill the holes in the spine to access the nerves to stop the pain? Well, I'm working on that. So when you get to the cure for multiple sclerosis, the disease that none of the big pharmaceutical companies are solving at all. He says, don't push me, but we'll get there. Now that is the power of shockwaves. Shall we go to the presentation which shows a bit of the history and a lot of photographs of what's been achieved with shockwaves, and I'll talk through it. In this picture we see that shockwaves are not new. It goes back, it is said, to war days. But really the action starts with Dornier. 
we must attribute to them the invention of shockwaves, I feel. Using exactly this method of electrohydraulic, electro, the bag of the electricity, hydraulic because it's inside water. And by the 1980s, they'd given it the name lithotripsy, which I think is from the Greek, I'm not a linguist, to break the kidney stones. And remember that millions of people have been treated with very high power energy going into the kidney and no side effects, no problems. So don't worry about any curdling of the blood or whatever fears you may have. There are no side effects to worry about with shockwaves. The orthopedic applications, healing a broken bone, that saves a lot of amputations, that one alone. By the early 90s, the powerful machines for healing bone were being reduced in size so that it was more ergonomic to work on the heel, the knee, the elbow, the shoulder, the heel spur, the tennis elbow, the golfer's elbow, the calcified shoulder, probably one of the main applications of shock waves now is calcified shoulder. And then we get to about 2000, it shows there 2004, and Wolfgang Schaden showing that wounds can be healed. Heart surgery, that's not difficult. It might sound difficult, because it's always been a bit um, romantic, I think, as treating the heart. But it's, it's just a, a plumbing problem. There's a blockage. Similarly, a blockage for erectile dysfunction can be dealt with with shockwaves. Cellulite, where tiny globules of fat are trapped in a layer that has no blood in it, can be released by shockwaves. Next one. And the top diagram is what I drew for you in the start of this speech. And in the middle diagram, here, if it's clear enough, is what I've drawn in vertical format there. Now we see a shape of parabola concentrating the shock waves at a point or in an almost parallel fashion, spreading out the shock waves. We call it infinity, some people call it a pulse wave, some people call it a flat wave. It's all parallel waves allowing the shock wave to pass through the body. What happens when these shock waves hit a virus, a bacteria, or even a parasite? Is they pass through very fast this tiny little creature and stretch it. And it comes back under its own elasticity and a quarter of a second later another bang goes through. And this is repeated until eventually that little creature is damaged, killed. Which is how mechanically we kill infection. We do not poison it as do the pharmacists. The pharmacists need to know what poison what drugs to use on the infection. We don't care. We can just bang it and kill it. So we don't waste time waiting to find out what mutation has taken place to know what drug to apply. We can just dive in there and kill anything and clean the blood and maybe therein lies a cure for hepatitis C, HIV, malaria, I think we've got the tool to do it. It's up to somebody now to get out there and do it. Next one. The interesting question here is, does it work as well on an uninfected wound, a non-infected wound? And rats in Salzburg about 13 years ago had the skin lifted off, put back, and one side was treated with shock waves, but not the other side. And the side that was treated healed better than the side that was not treated. So even where there's no infection, 
you get improved wound healing. The top right hand corner of the picture is showing the blood flow effects and the growth factors caused by the impact of the shock waves. Next one. She's 94 years old. That wound hadn't healed under its own accord and whatever was done to it. But with shock waves, there's complete skin coverage in seven weeks. Next one. These ulcers are difficult because there's little blood flow. And the shock waves improve the blood flow. The blood carries white cells which do the healing. They bring in stem cells. Nitric oxide is formed under the wound. The brain knows to bring in the immune system because the shock waves hit the nerves, carry the message back to the brain. And in six weeks, what had failed to heal has now got skin coverage, practically without scars. Next one. A nasty gash. And in many cases, whatever care is taken, big wounds can pick up infections. In 11 weeks, you're getting towards coverage. Next one. And it's obvious that what is taking place is the growth of a new organ rather than just wound healing.
his metalwork inside to hold the bonds in place. It's not a problem. Take the shock head and zap from every angle. Go right round the leg, zapping in there. The shock waves will bounce off the metalwork and be just as effective. And you'll get here. Next one. <clears throat> I think we see the, the fracture here is closing up. There's always a debate how much you need to fix the bones and how much movement you need between the two surfaces. Either way, you're going to need shock waves to start that process. Bring in the osteoblast. Next one. The gain in the finger from the fractures to new bone. A gap of six millimeters can be bridged by shock waves. Next one. And again, pins in the bone are not an obstacle at all. We work with that. Next one. In fact, shock waves can work with whatever else you want and have been doing. Whatever you want to do, we can also do shock waves. The diabetic, which is a complication, a smoking diabetic is even more difficult because of the vascularization being weak. But we can heal them. Next one.
Capillary growth of veins is stimulated. If the nerves are damaged, nerves are caused to repair. Next one. That's the direction we're heading in. Next one. The American military injured in Afghanistan and Iraq all types of injuries were brought back, treated with shockwaves, and are getting very good results. The data is being analyzed for, by the FDA for approval. And that approval is expected soon. One of the interesting but tragic consequences is a lot of, um, of amputations. And where you've got the, the, the soldiers complaining that they've got itchy feet, but they have no feet because it's been amputated. They're often filled with drugs to stop the brain sensing the, the false message about something from the foot. The drugs are not the answer. A five minute treatment with shockwaves on the stump will reprogram the nerves, which tells you that the nerves have a memory. Maybe memory is not the right word, but that simple procedure of being able to reprogram what the brain knows is there in the body tells you that you have to do something to the shockwaves, to, to the nerves with the shockwaves, to get the change. The bang we're making here, and all the machine does is bang. All that does is only two things into the body. It damages and it provokes. Damage we've seen in the earliest application, which is breaking a kidney stone. We see it breaking the um, spur, heel spur, the calcification. The provocation comes if it's hitting an area where there's an inadequate blood supply. You could, might, you could say it's a sort of damage. The body will respond by growing more veins into that area, by creating nitric oxide, by realizing that it needs to make a repair and send white cells and stem cells to that area. It's that provocation by triggering the immune system that is clever about shockwaves and therefore has to be seen as a separate new branch of medicine, quite different to pharmaceuticals and surgery. Next one. The cellulite we mentioned and the burns and the lipiolysis. This is now proven when this slide was created. It was a bit experimental. It's now proven. Next one. Arthritis can be treated in all mammals. And I say that because there's a big application in dogs, in veterinary. Horses are, are treated, and we tried it on humans first. Next one. In the mouth, it is said that 50% of the population have periodontal disease. And that's difficult to treat because there's a platform protecting the bacteria. Getting drugs in there is a problem. All drugs have a side effect. They can damage your digestion system. If you've got a patient on antibiotics, you're depriving them of nutrition which they need to get from their food. If you can keep the patient off antibiotics, you're going to get better healing. So the dental application is very important. It's very quick, easy. You put the shock wave against the cheek, bang, 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 kill the infection, job done. Next one. Working on the nerves is going to be exciting. A lot of research at the moment 
outside shockwaves is going nowhere. The problem with the brain is it's well protected by the skull. So penetrating the skull and then getting access with accurately aimed shockwaves will be an interesting area. The tools are there. It just needs somebody with the bravery to go and do it. Heart surgery. There's two approaches to this. One is completely non-invasive and the other is lifting the heart out of the chest and treating it. You hold the heart in one hand and the shock head in the other and bang away at the area where you want to release the blockage and then the heart can be replaced and the chest stitched out. It's a choice the doctors will make how they do it. And shockwaves are used for this. If you're releasing a blockage, put a stent, a balloon stent in place to stop any particles passing through to the brain. You don't want to have a stroke. Next one. Yes, of course it works on plants. Whether it's cost effective, I don't know. All the viruses from bird flu and the like could be killed with shockwaves. Again, is it cost effective? I've explained the history of shockwaves and I want to fit in now the history of my company Salsonic. I want to explain that there are different types of shockwaves and why the electrohydraulic is best. And then we'll get on to the protocols. I'm now an old man and probably have been in shockwaves longer than anybody else in the world. It was about 1987 I was working on the Dornier machine in St. Thomas's Hospital in London, the first one ever in Britain. It cost then one and a quarter million pounds. Machines that can do the same job are available now for just a few thousand pounds. That is how the industry has changed. As I say, those types of machines are available in every hospital in the world now. This area has come along. And I was the distributor in Britain for a Swiss-made machine called HMT, which is no longer available. And I got out of it, and we were in other industries. But an opportunity arose to get back into it. And I thought, if we make a machine in Europe, the Chinese would copy it. We have to do something to prevent them. And I've sub-licensed our production to India. And we're now cheaper than the Chinese. I went to India and said, what I want is that. But I couldn't give him anything to copy. We have not copied anything. We have started from the beginning and made a machine with a better circuitry than anything else available at a half to a third of the price of anything else. So, if I say it's cheap, and that's the English word cheap, I don't mean it's inferior, it's actually better. And the reason for doing this is, it makes no sense to have a fantastic means of curing only available to rich people. The majority of the population of the world are in poorer countries. And to enter those markets, we have to have lower prices. And Celsonic has done that. So my task is to sell into India, into China, Europe, and maybe at the bottom of the list into America, which is barricaded by the FDA. But we should get there. Different types of shockwaves. I must bring you back to where we started. The, the most important characteristic physics 
we've already got the fastest, the fastest that's possible. There's another method using crystals, and that's slow. So because it's slow, you need more treatments. And the more treatments there are, the more expensive is the cure. To cure anything, be it a wound or an injury, the most expensive item during the treatment isn't the machine at all, it's the doctor. So the less we employ, use the doctor, the cheaper is the treatment. The second most expensive item is the room in which the treatment is taking place. There's a rental cost or there's a capital cost for that room. In third place, comes the cost of the machine and any consumables that go with the machine. The electromagnetic cameras will say their shock head does not need to be replaced. However, the generator in the machine is a consumable and after a million shocks it has to be replaced at a cost equal to about the price of a brand new cell sonic. And the cell sonic has a warranty of 10 years. When we proposed whether to do that, it wasn't a discussion whether we give it a warranty from two years to 10 years. It was warranty for 10 years or for life. And if any customer insists that he wants warranty for life, we'll give him it. Let me admit that what's in it for us is not the sale of machines. It's treatments because our shock heads are consumables. Once the machine is in place, then we can start to make a profit. We are in it for profit. We wouldn't be doing this if there wasn't something in it for us. And you are getting the lowest cost means of healing. If anybody is saying, I can't afford to get a cell sonic, it makes no sense. You can't afford not to do it because you're already spending more than you need to spend. Spend less by using a cell sonic. The shock heads are the consumable part. We will maintain that machine so that we can keep supplying you with shock heads. It makes sense for us and we will encourage your business to heal more people. The electrohydraulic system used by cell sonic will give the lowest cost of cure. And the benefit of that is that everybody wins. Let me give you some numbers from Britain, where three billion pounds is spent every year on wound management. And they talk about wound management, not wound healing. Now, from a study done by Wolfgang Schaub, the person who discovered wound healing, he took over 200 patients would fail to heal their wounds, whatever was done to them. Oxygen tents, stem cell therapy, you name it, they tried it and it failed. He took those patients using shockwave machines, same as cell sonic, and he healed 74%. At a quarter of the cost of any other method. So for a country like Britain, 60 million people expenditure three billion pounds a year, we can save 2.4 billion, 2,400 million pounds off that bill. And pro rata, the same would apply to France, which is the same population, Germany 80 million. We can, you can save billions, not millions, billions of euros, dollars, pounds off your healing bill by using this method. And that's only wounds which you're struggling with. Now, what do you do? An open wound, clean it, deep it, as you do now. Completely. If there's any old flaky pieces of skin, get them out. And one of the easiest ways then is to flood the wound with insulin. Just pour the insulin over it. You don't have to use that. You can use a gel, something with no bubbles in it. 
put over that a cling film, which is going to work as a barrier film. On the cling film, put gel, then the shock head, and treat at 100 shocks per square centimeter plus 350. So if you've got two square centimeters, 200, plus your 350, about 550 shocks, and no more. And when I said to Wolfgang Schaden, why do you think no more? He said, I don't know. And I suggested that we could be harming the white cells, the platelets. And that's something that needs to be investigated, but I'm pretty sure that's what's happening. So follow the protocols exactly. And also treat around the wound, penetrating under the skin that looks to be all right, but remember, underneath there is an infection, which the drugs are not reaching, which is why the wound isn't healing but the shock waves can kill, damage the infection. Heel spur, 1,000 shocks. Energy level 5, takes about 5 minutes. For that one, you will need a local anaesthetic, a liquid cane. For pretty well everything else, you do not need an anaesthetic, especially with the cell side, because we've used a clever little trick called the analgesic factor. When you hit a nerve repeatedly, it goes numb. So we start at a low energy level until that nerve gets numb and build it up. And the patient doesn't know that they're getting more impact. They don't feel it. And it was uh, it's now two weeks ago, I treated the director of the hospital in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia who was insistent she couldn't stand the pain. I said, no, sit there, dear, and I treated her. It was on her arm. And I started at energy level three, and we increased it to energy level seven, and she never knew, she never knew that she was getting higher energy levels as we advanced through the treatment. It only took five minutes. And only one treatment is required, and the report I've got is that they now say they're all cured. It cannot be that they're fully cured, but the healing is starting and the nerves have stopped complaining. So the patient feels they're all right. The patient can carry on moving and working as normal, but don't overstress the injured area for about six to eight weeks. The time scale, you can understand, because if you've got a fracture, it can take six to eight weeks for the new cells to grow. In so many of these treatments, it's not that we're removing something like a kidney stone or fat, it's that we're causing to grow new cells and you have to allow time for that. The speed of healing is not a function of the machine, it's a function of the body. So it's a natural process, just give it time. And remember, the shockwave is provoking, it's damaging or provoking. We we, the, the shockwaves, are not healing, it's the body that's healing. And that's what's so good about it, that it's natural, it's drug-free. I think that tells you what is so good about the shockwaves, why it's better to use shockwaves than any previous method. Avoiding the side effects to the provider, maybe the state, the government hospitals, is going to save a lot of money. The patient is saved from the invasion of their digestion system and all the side effects of that happens. Everybody has, and probably will still need to have for some applications, antibiotics. They don't work. You run into the time. You can't get any energy, whatever you eat. And not until you're off the antibiotic and building yourself back up again with all the nutrients and the, and the antibodies that your stomach requires, only then do you feel better. If you can avoid the antibiotic, far better. And the resistance that's growing in the world to antibiotics. Have we got here a cure for malaria? We could have. In 
West Africa, Barola's disease, Leishmania's disease, we can zap it with shockwaves, kill the parasite. Then we have an ordinary wound, and we can heal the wound. Cellulite, yes, we can do that. From a market point of view, that is a big one. Wounds can be one person in 500, 0.2% of the population. Cellulite can be 20% of the population. And it works, and there's nothing else works. Let me explain how it works on the cellulite. Cellulite is a fat layer without blood in it. Starvation will not remove it. If you want to get thin, stop eating and drink only water. It's drastic and nobody does it. And you've seen cellulite on the, on the women tennis players. They, they show it the way they jump around with the little white frocks on. And they have no fat, but they've got the cellulite. By hitting it with shock waves, that layer holding tiny globules of fat is burst open. The, the globules of fat are released. They know where to go until the body responds to the provocation of the shock waves by growing a capillary veins into that area down which the globules of fat can escape. And that leaves you with skin that's too big. What has to happen then is we've got to tighten the skin. Going back now to what I told you about wound healing, we can grow new fibres, new cells, and that's what happens. The collagen is strengthened, and only shock waves are doing that. We can remove fat, ordinary fat, easily by the process of radio frequency, also known as ultrasound and high frequency. We're cooking it. We're changing the viscosity, melting the fat, and that can flow out into the digestion system. You get an energy boost, and you get thinner, and your skin sags. And you say, oh, I don't look any better. Growing the fibers in the collagen can take up to three months and longer, and that will tighten the skin. Nothing else works. Lasers, radio frequency, ointment, screams, it doesn't work and you know it doesn't work, even though we're spending billions on it. So CellSonic has its name from cell for cellulite and sonic for cell waves. That's the big one and that's what we're also treating.